Welcome to United Church of Hyde Park. Today, I want to take the opportunity just to wish you a happy Sunday, to wish you those who have bore the title or the role or the work of being a father, I'd like to say happy Father's Day. This is a special day, and fathers are special people. Happy Father's Day. As well, I don't know if you guys have heard the fireworks or you've seen all of the processions that are going on around Chicago. Uh, this weekend, we celebrate Juneteenth. And just so I want to make sure that everyone in my congregation knows what Juneteenth is, I decided to share a little bit of information about that. Um, Abraham Lincoln, when we went to Civil War, they fought and he freed the slaves January 1863, January 1st. 1863, except the slaves in Texas didn't know. They didn't know for two and a half years. So two and a half years on June the 19th, 1865, they were notified that you are no longer slaves, hence the celebration of Juneteenth. So happy Juneteenth Day, happy Father's Day, happy Sunday. It is so good to have you guys joining us, tuning in live on Facebook or Zoom. We are so glad to be gathered here today. Welcome to United Church of Hyde Park. We are calling you to worship. We are calling you here this call. We call all of you to enter into worship with us today. Sing, sing of God's unalterable love. We will rejoice as we walk in the light of our God. Tell everyone around you of God's faithfulness. We will share the stories of the one who experienced our life in all its fullness. Shout out loud of God's presence with us on this day and in all the days to come. Justice and goodness are God's gifts to us. Truth and love walk by our side.
Son of God, we magnify you. Son of God, we magnify you. You saved us from sin, gave a new life within. Son of Hello, United. Today we are reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10, verses 40 through 42. I have to say this for all my people in Bible study who do the lectionary text. I am doing next Sunday, but the person that will be here next Sunday will be doing the lectionary text for today. So I know a few of you will be like, where did she get that text from? It's actually the lectionary text for next Sunday. Let us read together. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of God's word. We've been on a sermonic theme for this month, Good Times. Today, my subtitle is Do the Work, Part 3. Do the Work, Part 3. I come from a long line of people who believe in cooking everything until there is no life left in it. To say that a piece of meat or food is done is an understatement. We do not play with our food. It's like some kind of virtue or something. So to say I had fallen from grace when I decided to eat my steak less than well done is an understatement. And I had fallen even further from grace when I discovered over a friend's house that the steak actually came alive in rare condition with a touch of seasoning. My fall from grace was even bigger when I tried sushi. My family really thought I had lost my mind. So about a decade ago, when I decided to try raw oysters, because they really did look good on the person's plate next to me, I had really fallen away from my southern, southern, southern deep roots. Oysters are already an acquired taste. Not everybody eats them, but I had grown up with my grandmother seasoning them and putting them in cornmeal and deep frying them and cooking them well done. That's the way you eat an oyster. So the thought of putting something slimy in my mouth, cold and raw, was a journey. But when I finally jumped the broomstick and I put a touch of horseradish and lemon and Tabasco on each of these fresh oysters chilled on a shell sitting on a bed of ice. It was seafood heaven. There was no turning back from me. 
Yummy. Oysters on a shell was an expensive treat. It wasn't something I was going to do every day. A couple of years ago, there was an oyster festival and me and a friend went out to the oyster festival. We got our tickets and we could get so many oysters, different kinds. I spotted this guy well built on the side who was shucking the oysters. I observed him and he made it look really fairly easy. I went over and observed him peel open the shells and pop the oysters out. And I asked him, how easy was it? And he said, after you do 500, it's really easy. I kept that number in mind, 500. All I had to do was shuck 500 oysters. It was gonna be easy. I went on Amazon, I ordered my oyster knife. I was in Whole Foods and I saw the difference in price between shucking them myself and going out to a restaurant. I even got my gloves. I turned those into garden gloves, by the way. <laughs> I'm going to get to that in a few minutes. So one Friday, I was feeling particularly brave, and I went in Whole Foods, and I got my oysters, and I was ready. I set up camp, got myself a cold drink, and I began to work on shucking oysters. I don't know if you've ever done this before, but this is some hard work here. <laughs> I tried, I watched the YouTube video, I tried to have some kind of skill set, but I also kept in the back of my mind, all I had to do was shuck 500 oysters. So for a couple more times, I would buy oysters, and it would take me like 90 minutes, my back would be hurting. Really, I felt defeated. It really takes a lot of work until you get to the 500. I'm not sure I'm ever going to make it to the 500 to know how easy. So I can tell you that it takes a lot of work to shuck oysters. That man made it look easy, but actually, it was hard work. And that's what I want to talk about this morning, doing the work. An anonymous author once said that anything worthwhile takes work, maybe like shucking oysters or Maybe you can use your own imagination. I've learned through living, and I'm sure some of you have, that anything of value, anything of deep meaning requires work. It requires that you put work into it. In fact, often in marketing, when you hear the word free, you should run. Because usually it's anything but free, and it will cost you. If it sounds too good to be true, Honestly, it is. In fact, sometimes relationships haven't worked because someone or some ones were not willing to put the work in. Because real things, real matters, real stuff, real people, real relationships, real change takes work. It takes a lot of work. I want to talk to you about doing the work. This is where we enter the biblical text today. Jesus is sending the disciples into the world of COVID and Black Lives Matter. No, seriously, Jesus is sending the disciples into the world. And part of sending folks is that you don't know what you're getting. You don't know what you're going to encounter. In fact, Jesus keeps it 100% real with his disciples. And earlier in the text, if you go back, he says, look, I'm sending you into some tough situations. You might even experience some violence. You will not be liked. You might even have to run for your life. When Jesus says persecution, it means people are not going to like you. In other words, caring for people takes real work. It takes real effort. They do not always appreciate the good you will do for them. Real work, discipleship, caring, being followers of Christ takes real work. Dr. Kent Keith says, people are illogical unreasonable and self-centered, but love them anyway. 
Love them anyway. If you do good, people will accuse you of selfish ulterior motives. Do good anyway. If you are successive, successful, you win false friends and true enemies. Succeed anyway. The good you do today, it'll be forgotten tomorrow. Do good anyway. Honesty and frankness make you vulnerable. Be honest and frank anyway. The biggest men and women with the biggest ideas can be shot down by the smallest men and women with the smallest minds. Think big anyway. People favor underdogs but follow only top dogs. Fight for a few underdogs anyway. What you spend years building may be destroyed overnight. Build anyway. People really need help but may attack you for helping them. Help them anyway. Give the world the best you have anyway. In my words, do the work anyway. These words are written on Mother Teresa's wall in Calcutta, India. I, I put Indiana, but I mean India. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> Jesus knew that he was sending the disciples into a world that was chaotic. Maybe there's some parallels to our world today. I read this quote, even though they can be parallel truths, they never meet. We heard that in the comedy class past Wednesday. So there's a parallel going on, even though these time periods may not actually meet. There's a parallel truth between when Jesus sends the disciples into the world and us in our present time today. Interestingly enough, I watched this document, Daughters of Destiny, The Journey of Shanti Bhavan, which tells the story of an Indian father, Abraham George. Abraham George came to America. He went through our school educational system. He became a businessman. He had his own company. He made lots of money, and at 50 years old, he said, I sense that there is more meaning to my life. I sense that with the time I have left, I want to do something different. He felt like he had accrued enough money, he sold his business, and he went back to India. And he built a school for kids from four years old up all the way through high school. And each kid that he admitted into his program would go through this system of support. They would leave home. It was actually a boarding school. And he would pay their way to college. But the commitment that they had to make is they couldn't live their lives for themselves, that they had to do the work and support their whole family and lift up their family out of poverty. He targeted the untouchables in his country. It's hard work. His son looked at him and joined in and is now the director. It's hard work. Our values and our ethics and our beliefs require us to do the work. Anything meaningful, when you look at something and you see something meaningful in society, often it is someone who has done the work. When you look at someone and they've got this awesome organization, often they've had to do the work. When you look at people that are in businesses for themselves, they will tell you they work late at night. They have to do the work. Because anything worthwhile, including our Christianity, requires us to do the work. In the text today, Jesus zooms in on the word welcome, to take oneself what is presented or bought by another to accept it, to embrace it. A welcome is to receive hospitality, to admit, to approve, to allow. It implies a subjective reception, showing that a decision of the will has taken place with respect to the object presented and that that acceptance manifests itself. Go with your whole heart. Jesus says to the disciples, go with good intentions. Give it your best shot. And even if that doesn't work out, if folks don't receive you, do the work anyway. If folks want to act funny, wipe the dust off your feet and go. But before you go, do the work. 
Do your best. This business of being sent and this business of receiving is one in which we often play both roles as followers of Christ. Sometimes we are sent and sometimes we are welcomers. And by that, I mean we receive those who come to us and folks come in all kinds of conditions. Some folks come not in their right mind and so they're disruptive to our community. Some come having lost a loved one and they feel down and they're hurt and they're depressed. Some come because they are entering a new area. They're coming from a different city and they're looking for a community. Some come because they have a need and they're looking for some sort of fulfillment or direction in their life. People are sent to us and we don't always know the when or the why of how people come, but all we need to do is do the work of receiving God's people anywhere and everywhere, and that requires work. It requires work for people to feel like they are welcome. People don't just come and feel welcome. About a decade ago, a friend of mine, he got a pastorate position on an island off the coast of Georgia. His partner decided that he would travel around to the local churches, and he looked up on the website and he would read different descriptions. He would look and find different things on social media about what the church said they were all about. And all of the churches said that they were warm and that they were welcoming and that they were inclusive and that they were inviting. And he said to his husband, it's amazing that of all these churches I've been to, often they're cold. Often no one speaks to me. Often after one person speaks to me, I sit alone. So it's interesting that they think that they're welcoming and they think that they're inclusive. Because see, being welcoming is not just something we speak. It's something that we have to do the work. You have to be willing to go outside of your comfort zone. You have to be willing to not sit at the table with all the people you know. You have to desire to love and embrace people as our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ embrace us. You have to be willing to come outside of yourself. You have to be willing to be vulnerable. Real welcome requires intentional work. It doesn't just happen. Today is Father's Day, and what makes some fathers special is that they're fathers beyond the title. Some fathers have done the work of being present in their children's lives. They tied their shoes. They took their kids to their sport practices and game. They read bedtime stories. They held their kids when their feelings were hurt and they were crying. They were the quiet, calm in their children's life. They are the confidence in their child's journey through their life. This morning, I had the opportunity to listen to Pastor Jamal Bryant. He did an interview with his dad for the first time. In all of his years of ministry, he's never, ever done this. And they just talked. And I saw the richness of him having his dad, who was present in his life for all of his life. Dads are important. Patrice Cullors, in her memoir, When They Call You a Terrorist, Black Lives Matter, talks about growing up, and at a point in her life, she had never met her dad because her dad was in jail. And he gets out of jail, and her mom is like, you can meet him, but you don't have to. And her mom is making all these excuses, but she decides that she really wants to meet her dad. And she's so glad that she meets her dad because her dad delights in her. And she said all these questions she had about herself got answered when her dad came into her life. A piece of her identity was solved. She found love and acceptance in his arm. He had her back. He was willing to do the work. Her world was complete with her dad. Doing the work means that we intentionally decide that we are going to be a church that is living in the world today. Today in our world right now, these are good times for us to do the work. There is so much work, literally, 
and I'm going to be sharing later in faith and action something you can be doing, but there is literally an excellent time. There is work that we can be doing. This is a good time to do the work as it relates to those who are oppressed and marginalized, people of color in this country. This is a good time to do the work of becoming allies with those who need our support. This is a good time to roll up our sleeves and join others in the human struggle for equality for all of humanity. Jesus concludes, you want to do the work. You want to shuck the oysters. You want to do the work. If you want to be on the side of justice, if you want to be really the church on the corner, this is good time. This is good times to do the work so that we can ensure that we're not just a church that looks good on a website or looks good on a Facebook page, but that we are doing the work so that we are intentional. We are intentional about making sure that everyone feels equality that everyone feels welcome. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for United. We thank you for our community. We thank you, Lord, that you give us an opportunity to strengthen our walk and our journey. We thank you, Lord, that you not only call us to you, but you send us you send us into the world to do the work. We come on Sunday to be fed, to listen to good music, to talk to one another, to be encouraged, to get a little bit of peace, but then you send us out on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday to do the work. Help us to not grow weary. Help us to see the light at the end of the tunnel Help us to hold on to your promise like Abraham and help us to do the work of being the church, of being your ambassadors, of being your feet, of being your heart, of being your hands. Thank you, Lord. Amen.
It is offering time. We live in a world that tells us that we are important by how many likes we get on Facebook. We live in a world that tells us we're important by some superficial outward signs. And a lot of times we buy it. We live in a world where we often compare ourselves to other. One of the beauties of the church is that everybody counts. And perhaps we could work a little bit on the branding of that, but every person counts. Every person that chooses to give <laughs> counts. Whether you give nothing at all, <laughs> it counts. Your giving counts here at United. However much you give, however little you give, it counts. It especially counts when it comes from the heart. We invite you week after week to give and to know that what you share with United really counts. We thank you uh, for the giving that has been shared so far. It's a miracle that we are even open. And so we thank you. We thank you for your giving, for your continued support. We just invite you to know that your giving counts. We need it. <laughs> we desire it. There are things in the church we are upgrading, working on upgrading our Wi-Fi, which will lead into more expenses because you count, because we want this message, we want our worship experience to not be in and out, we want it to be smooth, we want you to be touched, to be inspired, to feel connected, to united, you count. There are three ways that you can share your gifts with us. You can come by the office and drop it off during business hours, you can mail it, or you can give electronically. We invite you to share because you, you count.
Dear Lord, we are so glad that we count each and every sheep and glad to know that from a distance you are watching us. Bless this offering and bless this world. In Jesus' name, amen. We are now doing this thing called Faith in Action every Sunday where after uh, the sermon we share something you can be doing during the week that allows you to put your faith in action. And this Sunday, I would like to remind people if you haven't to complete the census, go out to 2020census.gov. A couple of weeks ago, somebody found me and was like, oh, go do this. I'm like, I've done it. And so I committed to tell two people. So if you've already done it, please tell two more people. Just encourage. A lot of times we assume the people around us are already doing what they should be doing. But when I found out that Snoop Dogg was voting for the first time this fall, I'm like, Snoop Dogg, you haven't been voting? It's like that. And so you'd be amazed that sometimes there's someone around you that you think is in the know that you think has done the business, taken care of the business, and maybe they haven't. So I want to encourage you on this week to share on your social media platforms or just to call up two friends and say, hey, did you sign up for the census? This is very important. Uh, critical decisions are made with the Senate census. Uh, the, the results of being counted impact communities. They impact new schools being built. They impact clinics and roads and services for our families, for older adults, for children. So it's very important that everybody is counted in the census. So I hope this week, as you put your faith in action, that you will tell others. And if it's you, you can be quiet. Just go on to 2020census.gov and make sure you register for the census. Thank you. That is our faith in action. Um, it is so good to have you with us today. We've come to that time where we're about to say goodbye to you. I know it hurts you and it hurts us, but we're about to come to that time. It's been good to have fellowship with you today. We hope that you go into the world and you do something tremendous, that you do the work. We will have a closing hymn and after the closing hymn, we will then have a benediction. Thank you again for joining us today. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. In seven days, you did a whole lot of work. And so with this day and with the days that you give us, let us be grateful and appreciative and let us make the most of the days and the stewardship that God has given to us. Do the work. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>